I'm glad you're here today on Good Friday. Good Friday is always a little bit more of a, of a somber service, even though we do celebrate the death of Christ. Uh, but man, be ready. Come Sunday morning, we are going to celebrate the fact that we serve a risen Savior and that Jesus is alive. I would encourage you to be inviting folks to be with us on Sunday. It's going to be a great service. Let me read just a a few verses as as we begin just our our thought today. In Mark chapter 15, we've been walking through the last 24 hours in the life of Jesus, and we've been walking through Mark chapter 13, 14, and 15. And so let me just read a few verses, Mark 15, beginning in verse 33. You can follow along in your Bible. We'll put it up on the screen. And when the sixth hour had come... There was darkness over the whole land until the ninth hour. And at the ninth hour, Jesus cried with a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lema sebachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And some of the bystanders hearing it said, behold, he is calling out to Elijah. And someone ran and filled a sponge with sour wine and put it on a reed and gave it to him to drink, saying, Wait, let us see whether Elijah will come down and take him. And Jesus uttered a loud cry and breathed his last breath. And the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. And when the centurion who stood facing him saw that in this way he breathed his last, he said, Truly, this man was the Son of God. Would you pray with me this morning? Father, man, thank you for the truths that we have sung about today. Thank you that you are marvelous. Thank you that you are wonderful. Thank you that you paid it all. And we actually will see that truth in our our talk this morning or this afternoon. And Lord, thank you so much for the price that has been paid for us And today in our hearts as we open our our mouths and we sing and in a few moments as we partake of the Lord's Supper, I pray that we would demonstrate a sincere heart of gratitude for all that Jesus has done for us. And we're reminded, as Stephen said, that even though he died on Friday, Lord, we know and we, uh, we, we believe that he rose again just a few days later for our salvation, for our justification. And this weekend, we rejoice in that. So Lord, challenge us. Lord, as we just look at a simple truth this afternoon, remind us of all that Jesus did for us. And it's in Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. I am notorious for starting something and not finishing it. Uh, I don't know why that is, but I often begin a task and, and for some reason never complete the job. I don't know whether this is a Brian flaw or, or wives, whether you would say that this is a man flaw. I'm not sure what it is, but, but it's my flaw. In the, and that character flaw is seen not only in big things, but it's seen even in the smallest things. For example, I regularly open up the freezer, pull something out of the freezer, and for some reason, don't shut the freezer door. And Vicki will come in and just point at the freezer, and I realize that I didn't finish what I started to do. Um, She'll come in the kitchen, and for some reason, I've pulled stuff out of the cupboards, and I have left cupboard doors open all over the kitchen and drawers open all over the kitchen. I do want to pause for a second and ask ladies, is that a Brian thing, or do any of your husbands do the exact same thing? Is it just me? It's a man thing. And so Vicki will walk in and it's like, you know, a tornado had come in and all the cupboard doors are open and all the drawers are open. And she's like, Brian, I don't understand. Why didn't you just shut them? And I'm like, I don't know. I got sidetracked. I got busy. I just didn't finish what you want me to do. Um, I have all kinds of books, scores of books on my shelf that I started, but I never finished. And one of the things Vicki gets on me all the time about, rightfully so, is she says that I always leave one bite of food on my plate, that, that I never completely finish everything that has been served to me. Well, thankfully, Jesus is not guilty of the same thing. 
As a matter of fact, Jesus came to earth to fulfill assignment, to an assignment, and Jesus was faithful until he had completely fulfilled everything his father had asked him to do. That, that truth is perfectly seen and perfectly stated in one of Jesus' final declarations on the cross. If you'll remember them with me, and I think we'll put them up on the screen, Jesus made seven declarations, at least seven recorded declarations while he was there on the cross. He said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they are doing. He said, today, he looked over at the thief, and he said, today you will be with me in paradise. He looked at John, and he said, uh, or he looked at Mary and said, behold your son. And he looked at John, and he said, John, behold your mother. And then he cried out, as we read here in Mark chapter 15, he cried out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me as he bore all of our sins in his own body on the tree? He cried out, I thirst. And then he made the statement that we're going to study today, it is finished. And he made one final statement that's recorded in several of the Gospels where he said, Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. Now, quite honestly, we could take the time and look at every one of those seven declarations because all of them demonstrate the character of Jesus. The sixth, though, the sixth generation, or not generation, the sixth declaration is especially important to us. And it's that declaration, it is finished. Now you might say, Brian, it, it, it's not mentioned in the passage that we're looking at here in Mark chapter 15. As a matter of fact, it's not mentioned in Matthew, it's not mentioned in Mark, and it's not mentioned in Luke. It's not mentioned in each of the synoptic gospels. All of them do say, as Mark says though, that Jesus uttered a loud cry, as it says in Mark chapter 15 and verse 37, he uttered a loud cry and breathed his last. But it's John, though, who gives us just a little bit more insight in John chapter 19 and verse 30, where John says this, and let me read the verse. When he had received the sour wine, he said, and here is the phrase, it is finished. And he bowed his head and he gave up his spirit. Wait, would you say that phrase with me today? Let's say it together. It is finished finished. Okay, that was about three of us. Would you do it with me today? Let's do it. It is finished. It's interesting that that, that, that three-word phrase in the original language is one Greek word. And I want to show you that word today. We'll put it up on the screen. It's pronounced like this, tetelestai. As a matter of fact, I want to give you just a little bit of a Greek lesson today. Would you repeat that with me today? Tetelestai. Say it again. Tetelestai. So you can go home today over lunch or over supper and say, boy, what was the service about today? And you can, you can spew out a Greek word. That, that word, uh, one word, but it, it, it probably is one of the most profound words in all of the New Testament. As a matter of fact, Charles Spurgeon made this quote about that word. He said, the word tetelestai is an ocean of truth in a drop of a language, one simple word translated into a phrase in English, it is finished, yet it is extremely profound. I want you to see today that it, it doesn't just mean as Jesus was on the cross and he cried out, and it says he uttered with a loud voice. And so, I mean, no doubt he was already weakened, he had been beaten, he had lost a lot of blood, and he summoned that strength within him to loudly cry, Tetelestai, or it is finished. It doesn't mean, as some of us would assume, that Jesus would simply say, Thank God that this is done. <laughs> it does mean that. But it means much more than that. It doesn't just mean, okay, my work is done, I now can give up the ghost, as the text seems to indicate. But as I mentioned, the meaning is so much more profound. Let me give you the definition today. I think we'll put it up on the screen. The word tetelestai means to bring something to a successful end, to complete something to finish the task, 
to bring something to its intended goal. And yes, it does talk about finality. And so when Jesus cried out, it is finished, he wasn't just saying, oh, thankfully, it's done, and he gave up the ghost. He was making a statement stating that the work, the task, the the responsibility that his father had given him to fulfill, he had completely fulfilled. This is an interesting word as you study throughout um, history and you, you, you study how this word was used throughout history. For example, whenever a servant was given a responsibility by his or her master, whenever they finished the task, whatever that responsibility was, they would come back to the master and they would simply say to the master, to Telestai, simply saying, I have done everything you asked me to do. The priests would use this word. Whenever, whenever a lamb was brought in for the sacrifice and the priest would examine that lamb to make sure that there were no defects, that the lamb was perfect, that it met all of the Old Testament regulations, as the priest finished examining that lamb, the priest would then look at the lamb and say, to Stella. To tell us that it is complete. The Lamb perfectly meets the requirements of the Old Testament. Merchants would use this word. Whenever someone brought in a bill and they paid their bill in full, the merchant would write on that bill, To tell us that paid in full. And it's really interesting that even a prisoner. A prisoner was given an indictment, and a prisoner was set off to prison, and whenever that prisoner fulfilled that prison sentence, the judge who condemned that prisoner would take that written indictment, and on that written indictment, the judge would stamp to Telestai, paid in full. And so when Jesus made that cry from the cross, The people who were there listening understood everything that Jesus was saying. And Jesus used that simple yet profound word to declare that his redemptive work was done. As I mentioned, he had finished the job that his father had given him to do. But there's one other deep thing I want you to see about this word because the tense in which it is used in the New Testament teaches us something else because the word is not just said in the past tense, finished, done, but it's found in what we call the perfect tense. And the perfect tense is something that is very significant because it talks about a past completed action with a present day effect or with a present day uh, application to our lives. And so I want you to see this. Even though Jesus died on the cross 2,000 years ago, and sometimes one of the struggles that you and I face as we share the gospel with others is, is many times they look at that as being past history. And they sit back and really wonder, okay, how in the world could the death of a man 2,000 years ago have any effect in my life today? And the verb tense is very profound because yes, it is used in a past tense verb, but it's used with a past tense verb that has an ongoing continuing effect and a continuing application in our lives. So here's what I want you to see, that the death of Jesus Christ applies, is applicable, has an effect in your life and in my life today. So I just kind of want to sit back for just a few moments, and I want us to just think, okay, when Jesus said to Telestai, when he said, it is finished, what does that mean for me? What does that mean for you in the year 2018? How does that apply to us, modern day people, contemporary people in this day and age? What does it mean for us? I want to mention three simple things that it means, yet three things that are extremely profound, and three things for which you and I should be today extremely grateful. We've already alluded to the first one. The first one very simply is this, the payment for your sins and mine has been fully paid. Let let that just sink in for a second. 
The payment for your sins and mine has been fully paid. Did you ever try to add the number of sins that you commit in a day? Or the number of sins that you commit in a week? Or the number of sins that you would commit in a lifetime? If we had somebody in the back, if we had Margaret, who's, you know, our numbers person, if we sit back and say, okay, Margaret, here's the deal. We want you to grab a calculator, and we want you to start calculating the number of sins that have been committed by the people in this room. The number would be what? It would be astronomical. <laughs> some of us maybe wouldn't have committed as many as others, and some of us maybe would have, considered a, have committed a lot more than others, but there is a large number of sins that have been committed by each and every one of us, maybe even in the five or six hours that we've been up today. And yet it's so important for us to realize that when Jesus died on the cross, he paid the penalty for every single one of those sins, every single one of yours, every single one of mine, every single one of those uh, of the person sitting next to you. As a matter of fact, every single one of everybody living in the city of Hollywood, everybody living in Broward County, everybody in the state of Florida, everybody in the United States and the world who have placed their faith and trust in Jesus Christ. He paid the price for all of our sins. You sit back and say, Brian, okay, where, where's that found in Scripture? Is that something that, that, that sounds good? It's a hymn. Let me show you some verses in Isaiah chapter 53, verses 3 and 4, 4 and 5. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we esteemed, we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. Verse 5, but he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace, and with his wounds we are healed. So here's the simple truth in a very, in a very true, in a very real way. That, that indictment that has been that spiritual indictment that was, that was placed upon your life and mine because of the fact that we are sinners, God took that indictment and he stamped on that indictment to tell us I paid in full. And the simple truth is that you nor I will ever have to stand before God and give an account for the sins that we have committed. Why is that? because Jesus paid it all. All to him we owe. Sin left a crimson stain, but what did Jesus do? He washed it white as snow. That's what the term tetelestai means, paid in full. I know times, sometimes we feel guilty of our sins, I know sometimes that, that, uh, that you know, we, we bear that and we go to God. We have this huge guilt in our life, but it's important for us to realize that when you and I, those of us who have accepted Christ as our personal Savior, when we go to God in prayer, and even though we should confess our sins, those sins of ours, past, present, and yes, even future sins that we will commit have been fully paid by Jesus Christ. And when he declared that on the cross, he was looking down the quarters of time and he was looking at Brian and he was looking at Stephen and he was looking at Jose and he was looking at you and he was making the statement, I have paid the price for all of your sins. To, to tell us die, they are paid in full. Let me ask you, when was the last time that you thanked him for that? When was the last time you just paused in a, in a moment of gratitude and a moment of worship and thanked him for that? The payment for your sins has been fully paid. Hudson Taylor, that great missionary, made this statement when he realized that. He said, there dawned upon me the joyous conviction that since the whole work was finished and the whole debt was paid on the cross, there was nothing left for me to do but to fall on my knees, accept the Savior, and praise him for all of eternity. Listen, you don't have to do anything to earn your salvation. Coming to church doesn't do it. Giving in the offering doesn't do it. Being good doesn't do it. There is nothing you can do. There's nothing you have to do because Jesus paid it all. That's what it is finished means. Let me show you a, a second truth, and this is, this is really profound for us and is very applicable for us. The truth is this. Sin was defeated. When Jesus cried out on the cross to tell us die, it is finished. At that moment, he defeated 
sin. Let me show you a couple of verses in Romans chapter 6. Paul makes this statement. For the death he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life he lives, he lives to God. So you also must consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ. Don't let sin reign in your mortal body to make you obey its passions. Let me ask you, do you ever feel like you're chained by sin? Maybe there's one specific sin in your life that has you bound, that has you chained, and you feel like you just can't overcome it, and you fight that battle every single day, and it seems like there's more days that you lose the battle than there are days that you win the battle, and you sit back and you cry out like the Apostle Paul in Romans 7, God, when are you going to free me from this bondage of sin that I face every single day? Well, the simple truth is, that he has already freed you. And he has already defeated sin. Catch this today. The sin that you struggle with is defeated. The sin that I struggle with is defeated. That which has you bound, whether it's an addiction, a habit, a hang-up, an attitude, whatever it is, that which has you bound has already been defeated by Jesus Christ. And when he cried out on the cross, it is finished. He was crying out and he was saying to Satan and he was saying to you and I that sin has been defeated. As a result, Paul says this, don't let sin have dominion over you. Don't let that sin which seems to trip you up and seems to defeat you on a regular basis, don't allow it to have dominion over you. Why is that? Because Jesus won the victory. Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, he says, man, he said, the sting of death is sin, the the curse of, of sin is the law, but thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. So we can literally claim every single day, you can wake up in the morning and say, God, today I claim the victory over this sin in my life. Lord, I claim the victory over over laziness. I claim the victory over not finishing the task. I claim the victory over impure thoughts. I claim the victory over anger. I claim the victory over whatever it is that you are struggling with because the victory is available to you. And you and I sit back then and say, well, Brian, that doesn't make sense. Then then why am I struggling with it? Why am I defeated by something that has already been defeated? Quite frankly, it's because you allow sin into your life and you allow sin to defeat you and you have not claimed the victory that is already yours. And so it is completely legitimate in your prayer time and in mine every single day to cry out to God and say, God, today I claim the victory that was finished by Jesus Christ on the cross, that was sealed on the day of resurrection, and today I claim that victory for my life. Help me to be victorious over whatever sin in my life. It is finished. The victory is won. Let me show you one third truth, and this was equally profound and equally important. But notice the third thing is this. You have been given the righteousness of Jesus Christ. And this is important as we talk about this ongoing battle with sin. Not only has Jesus paid the price for our sin, not only was that victory completely done, it's not that just God said, okay, let's take a broom and let's sweep out the heart of Brian, or let's, let's take some Lysol and let's clean out the heart of Stephen. Okay, that's done. And now we can go back in and, and fill that back with all the dirt that we had before. But God literally says, here's what, here's what I'm doing through the death of Christ. Your sin debt has been fully paid. So all of the sins that you've committed, past, present, and future, are placed in Jesus' account, and he paid the price for those sins. And if that was all that he did, that would be extremely profound, would it not? But he did more than that. He not only took all of our guilt upon himself, but he then takes the perfect righteousness of Jesus Christ, and he places it in your account, and he places it in my account as well. Notice this verse in Corinthians. Notice what Paul says. 2 Corinthians 5.21, For our sake he made him, Jesus, to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become 
the righteousness of God. So, so whenever Jesus cried out, it is finished, there was this divine transaction that took place. And tetelestai was a, was a transactional word. There was a divine transaction that took place. And in that moment, your sins, even though you had not been born, your sins were completely paid for. And as God looked down the quarter of time, he already placed in your account and in mine, he placed the complete righteousness of Jesus Christ. You have the righteousness of Christ in your life. I have the righteousness of Christ in my life. The simple truth is that we fail to activate the righteousness. We fail to activate what God has already granted to us by faith in our lives. And I'm sure at times, I know God is, is sovereign. He understands everything. He's omniscient. But I'm sure there's times that he looks down at Brian's life and he's so... Um, maybe discouraged, and I know he, he gets the whole concept, I get all of that, but there's got to be moments when he's like, come on, Brian, I've given you everything you need. You're struggling with the same thing over and over and over again. I already won the victory over that, and I've already given you the righteousness of Jesus Christ to win the victory over that sin. The victory is completely yours. Claim the victory. It's yours. Live in victory. Do not live in defeat. It's just as ludicrous us living in defeat as if you gave your child $100,000 or your parents gave you maybe a better uh, illustration $100,000 and you continued to live in abject poverty, not using that gift that had been given to you. And your father and mine would look at us and say, Brian, take advantage. The money is in the account. Use it. Use what has been given to you. And I continue to live in poverty and not use that which has been given to me for my livelihood. Listen, church, today as we come together and we partake of the Lord's Supper, we are reminded of the fact that everything that was needed to be done for our salvation was finished on the cross. And it was guaranteed with the resurrection of Jesus Christ. When he cried out, it is finished. I would like to think that he was thinking of Brian Burkholder. I would like to think that he was thinking of you. And he declared that everything necessary for your salvation, everything necessary for your justification, Everything necessary for your sanctification, everything necessary for your glorification has already been placed into your account. And Jesus said, it's done. Dad, it's done. Everything is paid for. I finished the task that you have given me to fulfill. Isn't that a great truth? Would you say that with me today? Let's, let's say that word again today. Would you say that word? Tetelestai. Say it with me today. Tetelestai. It is finished. So let me pause for a second as Vicki and Stephen come up in just a moment. So, so do you claim that truth in your life? Vicki and Steve, come on. Um, do you claim that truth in your life? Has there been... Let me ask you first and foremost, has there been a time in your life where you have confessed your sins, you have recognized that you were a sinner, you have repented of those sins, and you have turned to Jesus and Jesus alone as the only remedy for your sins? If you've never done that, the good news is that God desires for you to do that. And you can do that right where you're seated. You can do it in your heart of hearts today by, by repenting of your sin and by believing, by trusting in the finished work of Jesus Christ. As a believer, you sit back and say, Brian, I did that, whether it was a year ago or five years ago or 10 years ago, whenever it was, I did that. Well, today you can rest in that. And not only can you rest in that, but you can rejoice in that and you and I can, can live out this Easter weekend realizing that each and every day we are living out the truth of the resurrection, the truth 
of Jesus finishing God's task in our lives.